So uh, we are going to have a, a bit of a, a very casual chat. Uh, how many people here have used a programming language that is not like JavaScript or Node? All right, excellent. So oftentimes when we're thinking about our own tools, we look at them in a very microcosm -like way. We think about them very narrowly. And so what this panel is going to do is we're going to be talking to people who work on other package manager and package manager ecosystems um, to get a sense of the key values that they have, how they might be inspired or maybe perhaps not inspired by NPM, and potentially how they differ. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to start just with uh, some introductions. So if you could just let us know who you are and what you work on. Okay. So uh, I'm Samuel Giddens. I, um, let's see, what, what do I work on? So full time, I am a college student. And the other 24 hours of the day, um, <laughs> I work on the core teams of CocoaPod, Bundler, and RubyGems. So those, okay. <laughs> uh, so what those are, um, CocoaPods is a third party package and dependency manager for the Cocoa ecosystem. Um, so Objective-C and Swift. Um, RubyGems is the package manager for Ruby and Bundler is the dependency manager for Ruby. And uh, I'm currently working on combining those last two uh, so that I don't have to explain the distinction between a package manager and a dependency manager anymore. All right. Cool. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, wow, that's loud. Uh, I'm Andre Arco. Um, I'm probably better known as indirect on all the internet things. Um, and I've been working on Bundler since before 1.0. Um, and I guess I'm now Ruby Gems lead too, so that's cool. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Steve. Um, I used to do Ruby stuff, but now I work on the Rust programming language uh, for Mozilla. So I write documentation and do community advocacy. I also maintain the Semver package that Cargo, our package manager, uses and like work on Cargo a little bit. So that's why I'm here. Uh, fun fact, Andre and I used to be roommates, so that's pretty cute. Uh, <laughs> Today is full of fun facts. Um, fun great, so to kind of kick off the conversation, whenever you're creating an ecosystem, you often have some kind of fundamental values. And you have those values because you're trying to solve a very specific problem in a way. And oftentimes those values uh, shine through when you define your problem. So I'd like to hear from all three of you about how is it that you define the problem of package or de perhaps dependency management and what were the values that you took from that problem definition in creating the ecosystem you work on? So I have a mic, so I guess I'll go first. <laughs> Pass it back. Uh, so with Cargo, um, one interesting thing about it is that um, we got Cargo built before Rust was actually 1.0. And that seriously informed a lot of the ways that the language actually shaped up. So um, we were able to specifically move a bunch of the libraries out of the core language and into the ecosystem because we had a package manager. So in order to do that, we needed to make sure that Cargo was extremely reliable, so that was really important to us. Um, and then also another thing that's extremely important is that builds are repeatable. So we wanna make sure that whenever you download a random package and build it, uh, you get the exact same stuff that other people did, um, ideally down to the same bytes. Like you will get literally the exact same thing all the time. Um, and so that's what's ultimately, everything else is in service of that goal. Like how can I make a project, give it to you, and then you get the exact same thing. So from there comes out the dependency resolution, how things are laid out on disk, all that other shenanigans. Cool. Um, I guess Ruby and Ruby Gems have a very different story than Cargo, <laughs> um, which I feel like I should maybe lead with apologies because everyone dealing with Ruby Gems is like having to deal with all of the things that we now recognize were maybe not the best or were okay at the time but are terrible now. And we, it's really hard to change those things later. Um, Ruby Gems as kind of like a, RubyGems predates everything else here. Uh, it started in 2003. 
Uh, and it basically happened because Ruby already existed and there were already hundreds or maybe even thousands of people actively writing Ruby and being like, it's really frustrating that I can't share code. Uh, and so it was kind of like the, the easiest, smallest amount of work that would let people share code more easily. And that didn't last very long before it was no longer reliable enough and it had to become less easy and that's kind of like how we got where we are now. Well, that doesn't work anymore. What can we do that will work? Well, that doesn't work anymore. What can we do that will work? Uh, I guess culminating in now we have lots of servers and whatever, sixth generation uh, information about packages and a lot of that actually looks a lot like what NPM looks like today. So it's actually really interesting to me that package managers seem to all end up converging on something that's <laughs> that similar. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of have to give a disclaimer. Um, I did not start any of the projects that I work on. Um, I did not come close to being there at the start. So a lot of my perspective is coming in and uh, having to maintain stuff that I didn't really decide how to make and I don't necessarily like how they're built. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it turns out that when you have an existing community of users, um, they care much more that their stuff keeps on working than that your life as a developer is happy. Uh, so I get to just, you know, toughen up and deal with it. Um, so uh, a lot of the way that CocoaPods was designed was informed by the fact that people in the Apple ecosystem are very reticent to uh, accept things that haven't been blessed by Apple. So the first design decision of CocoaPods was to make it possible to build, you know, packages uh, outside of the packages source directory. So you could have official CocoaPods um, whose, you know, specification and metadata were maintained by people that didn't write the library. Um, so that has led to a lot of, um, you know, configuration decisions um, that maybe aren't necessary for us anymore, but were necessary back in 2011 um, when the idea of using an open source project was uh, laughable. Um, you know, the fact that you were, you were shipping someone else's code in your iOS app, um, you know, w was something that was really new at the time and was really driven by the explosion in, um, you know, contracting shops that would work on multiple apps and they wanted to share their code across, uh, you know, multiple apps that they worked on maybe for a month or two at a time. I forgot something really important, which is since Cargo is like extremely new, since Rust is extremely new, um, we were able to learn, um, so like sort of the opposite of what Andre was saying, that like dealing with the things that you did a long time ago, we were able to learn from those mistakes, but there's also a twist. So Cargo was like largely inspired by Bundler, but also we take a lot of cues from NPM and we've learned how like NPM improved upon the Bundler experience. But the twist is since we're in a statically ahead of time compiled language, some stuff has to be different because of like the language as well. So that's also like an extremely important part of understanding how Cargo fits into the rest of these kind of projects. Cool. Um, so one thing that we hear a lot uh, in package management, and we often talk about it as if we all mean the same thing, but I think we don't, is the idea of dependency hell. What is, <laughs> what is your personal definition of dependency hell? So I write, the, the way I got into Bundler and Ruby Gems and kind of CocoaPods was um, I rewrote the dependency resolver. So um, I am like, I, I guess if I wanted to make a grandiose Twitter bio for myself, it would be like, you know, dependency resolution expert or something like that. Um, so CocoaPods for a long time did not have a proper dependency resolver. 
so you'd oftentimes see error messages come up and it was basically like, oh, okay. So you as the user have to go in and fix everything. Um, and so, you know, it took a three month grant, but eventually I, you know, wrote something that, you know, solves the dependency hell problem. Um, but what is that problem? So wh what is the problem? Well, it, it kind of depends. Uh, it depends. <laughs> well, <laughs> It, 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 no, seriously, it, it does depend on the type of language that you're building in. Um, so the original dependency hell problem uh, kind of comes from the Microsoft world of, you know, DLL hell, um, where you have multiple uh, dynamic libraries that get linked in uh, at runtime and can stomp all over each other. Um, you have sort of the ahead of time compile issue where, um, you know, let's say you're in a language like Objective-C or Ruby um, where everything exists inside a global namespace. So you can only have one version of a package at a time. So then dependency hell is, okay, so I have this really large dependency graph um, and how do I make sure that everything is consistent and everything has a version that, of its dependencies that it's compatible with. Um, and that's, you know, that's actually getting into like a theoretically CS hard problem. I guess uh, coming from writing Ruby apps back in the day, dependency hell was uh, Rails. <laughs> uh, we love Rails, it's fine. <laughs> oh, I mean, Rails is fine, but dependency hell was I need to install Rails and I need to install this other gem and I need to run this other rep that's also Rails but isn't quite the same version, but it needs other things, but now I can't run them both at the same time. Uh, and that's the problem that Bundler ultimately exists to solve, which is every app can have its own set of dependencies that only work for that app. Um, and then inside that app you have like, well, and this is, this is, this is the one that I always used in all the talks where I was trying to convince people that Bundler was a good idea because when Bundler was first created, people were like, this is stupid. We don't need this. Uh, turns out we did. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the best one was that Rails would depend on action support and which depended on Rack and then the web server that you use to run your Rails app would also depend on Rack, and they depended on different versions of Rack. And so you would try to boot your Rails app and it would be like, nope, you can't use two versions of Rack at the same time. Uh, and Bundler figuring out, oh, there is a version of Rack that will make all these things happy, but it has to be this exact correct one uh, was a really big deal at the time. Um, seems like everyone's just like, oh yeah, isn't that how everything works? Isn't that how everything has always worked? Since I'm last, they stole all the good answers. Um, what it means to me personally is the DLL hell uh, because I'm secretly a cranky old man. Um, so I remember trying to play games and it's like, no, you can't load that. And then you like Google for the file name of whatever.dll and put it in a folder and pray that you didn't just like give all your secrets to everyone or whatever. Um, but I think that to sort of like kind of answer the question by just repeating the question, it's actually like the seven levels of DLL hell. <laughs> Like, so once you solve the basic problem of like, I need this library on my computer, then you have the problem of like, well, where do I get that library and how do I get that library and how do I know that it's reliable? And then you, from there you get the like, well, I'm a consultant and I have 15 different clients and I need this particular version of my language and this particular version of my libraries for this particular project that I'm working on. So it's actually like a multi-level problem and which hell you're in depends on like what layer you're at. But I think all of these are, all of these problems are related but they are also different and require like different kinds of solutions. Cool, so uh, to take a, a bit of a turn here, we've been talking a lot about the technology, but it turns out that also working on package managers means that you're running an ecosystem, which means that you have to deal with lots and lots of people working with each other. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> something that's come up obviously for NPM is the need to have very specific policies regarding how people contribute and how people publish packages. Um, if you have any like vignettes or stories or policies about issues you ran into in your ecosystems, I'd love if you could share them. 
Uh, I guess R Ruby's kind of interesting in that the packaging ecosystem basically happened by accident. Uh, there was no design, there was no grand plan, there was just like, whoa, there's all these Ruby programmers and they keep writing things and being like, hey, this is cool, check it out. Uh, and there was, there was genuinely a point in time where the Ruby library ecosystem was the individual personal blogs of everyone who wrote Ruby at the time, being like, hey, here's a .rb file, it's got cool stuff in it. <laughs> um, and, and then someone was like, hey, we should put links to all these blog posts in a centralized place. And for a while, that was the ecosystem, the Ruby application archive, a bunch of links to blog posts with tar files on them. It was amazing. Uh, and so I guess the Ruby ecosystem has been a very reactive process of like, whoa, something happened. We should maybe do something about that. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I guess in, in an attempt to learn from other people's mistakes, I guess, as Steve was saying, we're even today like working on a set of official Ruby gems policies, but like we don't have a cool funded company behind us. So, uh, you know, like we're, we have a couple nonprofits and so we're like kind of squeaking towards, oh, it would be, it would probably be a good idea if we had a policy around this. What is a good policy? How do we get a lawyer to check this policy? Um, so we're, we're getting close, uh, but that's definitely like a, a big official thing that, that we haven't even finalized yet. I have lots of stories about policies. I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, uh, this sort of also ties back into the first question of these policies come out of your principles. So like, what are you actually trying to accomplish? So for example, um, one of the policies that we made with crates.io, which is the website that hosts all the code that Cargo knows how to pull down, um, is that you can never actually delete a particular version of a package. Um, and that was like a decision we made because again, this focus on reliability, uh, we wanna make sure that you know people's builds are not going to break. Now this ties into other policies in interesting ways. So for example, we also decided that everything is going to be a flat namespace on crates.io and there is not going to be sub namespaces. And there are various different reasons that we did this, but one of them is that we fundamentally believe that the like quirky names for packages is better than the generic names for packages. So like I think that like iron versus nickel is better for everyone than Steve slash web server and Andre slash web server, for example. Um, so that was a particular policy decision that we made. Um, and another one was what squatting means is extremely hard to define. So if someone takes a particular package name um, and then doesn't do anything with it or doesn't update their code in a while or whatever, we're not going to take it away from them and give it to someone else. So when you look at the intersection of all of these policies, uh, someone who got particularly mad about the lack of namespacing said, well, I'm just gonna go and register a whole ton of really generic package names then, and like got 50 packages of like IRC, web server, HTTP, like whatever, and then they were like effectively squatting on these packages, so we had to have an interesting community conversation around like, are these rules and the intersections of them what we actually want to hold? And uh, what's funny about that is when we're saying we think that generic names are bad, someone taking away all the generic names and then not using them for projects is like actually not a bad thing. <laughs> um, so you know, eh. so these, the namespacing thing is something that still continually comes up and we'll see how that gets revised in the future, but it is true that like you have to work with the community that is using your particular system to figure out if these rules um, you know, matter. So the last policy I'll mention that, that is interesting and important is like, we said the code of conduct applies to package names. So like if people make a package name that's like a racial slur, uh, we will nuke that package and take it away. But also that we weren't like proactively scanning everyone's things to make sure like we're relying on the community to like let us know like by the way someone took this package and it's like offensive in some way. So there's also all kinds of balancing um, around that um, and how that stuff works. So one of the interesting things about CocoaPods is that it started with a very manual uh, process for publishing new pods. Um, 
all the specifications that you know define what the public set of pods are are hosted in a Git repo. Um, we had some drama this year about the fact that it's a very large Git repo and that Git does not handle shallow clones very well. Um, so that, that, was, that was a fun thing that we dealt with right before we hit 1.0. But what that meant was that people would submit pull requests uh, saying here's you know the new specification and um, you know we would lint them on CI uh, and there was a guy Keith Smiley whose main contribution to Cocoa Pods was merging literally thousands of these pull requests. Um, now we broke the Git repo a couple years ago. And it turns out that that made people very unhappy because they couldn't use CocoaPods at all. Um, so we decided, okay, we need to have uh, an authentication server that deals with this stuff, kind of like rubygems.org, but also, um, you know, we as a project are very poor. So how can we do this running on like one Heroku dyno? Um, and, and we do, um, and so, you know, we did that, we started to automate things, um, culminating in, with the release of 1.0, we just said, um, no more pull requests to the specs repository. Um, if you own a pod, you can deprecate versions, there's a command for that, there's an API for that. Um, you can delete a version of a pod, there's a command for that, it's, it's all on you. Because about a year ago, um, Twitter decided, hey, this CocoaPods thing seems cool and we're sick and tired of our users asking us to support it, so we're going to support it. And there was an existing fabric pod that someone in the community was maintaining. Um, we transferred it over to Twitter. Uh, we celebrated for about 10 minutes. And then they deleted all the existing versions um, and published their own versions with whatever versioning scheme they were using. And uh, this broke everyone's build. Everyone's build. Uh, and it meant that you could no longer go back in time and get history and download things. It, it, was, it was terrible. Uh, and from that point forward, we decided we don't want this responsibility. So we've sort of taken the, the anti-policy approach of saying, um, we want to make as few decisions as possible. Uh, you know, we're a small group of people. We don't want to be responsible for things. Um, and if that means maybe having something that's a little bit worse or a little bit less consistent, um, that's fine with us. Yeah, that sounds like a familiar situation. <laughs> Um, all right, so to round this out, uh, thank you again for all of your answers. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you, uh, what is the biggest challenge that your ecosystem is currently facing, and what is your dream feature for your package manager? Biggest challenge for CocoaPods is the fact that people still just dislike the existence of the project. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, it's That's it's very honest. It's it's true. It means that you know the issues we get are, are less. It would be cool if and more, uh, you know, sort of justify your existence, and that gets really tiring. Um, as for the biggest feature I'd like to see in Cocoa Pods, um, it's something that is probably its biggest strength compared to any other package manager I've seen, and that's uh, I want the even more uh, extensibility and pluggability. So this ties in with the ethos of being small and being hands-off. Um, we wanna push as much development onto other people as possible and uh, support only what we need to support and say, uh, hey, that's a cool idea you have there. Uh, it would be awesome to see you build a plugin to do that. I guess, uh Time has solved the problem of people thinking that Bundler needs to justify its existence, which is nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, 20, 2010 to 2012 was an exciting time, let me tell you. Uh, now, that, now that Bundler's existence is justified, I think my 
my dream feature is a way for us to keep undoing things that from the past that are now terrible without breaking everyone, which I have no, no feasible way of doing within the laws of physics, but it's a good dream feature. Uh, did that answer both your questions? And then the biggest challenge. Oh yeah, and the biggest challenge. Yeah, the biggest challenge is definitely having to continue to support all of the things from the past that <laughs> are very, very difficult and that I have no, no feasible way of getting so rid of. So same answer for both. Same answer for both. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So biggest challenge for cargo, um, let me tell you a story and see if it sounds familiar. There's a programming language which by design has an extremely minimal standard library and therefore people depend on the package ecosystem for a large number of features that would be considered very basic standard library elements in languages that have a more fully featured standard library. So people use the package manager ecosystem for everything and they really, really like it. But the problem is, is there's too many packages that all do the same thing and no one has any idea which ones of them are good or what good even means when it comes to packages. So that is the biggest challenge for cargo is like as we continue to grow this ecosystem out, people are like, I don't know how to find good packages that do what I want um, and I'm not really sure out of all these multitudes of options which ones are the right ones that I should pick. Um, so that's, that's like cargo's biggest challenge moving forward. The team actually just announced what we thought would be a good idea to the community and they all disagreed. So we're gonna go back to the drawing board on fixing that. I don't know, we'll see how it happens. Uh, it's been a rough week. Um, dream feature. So there's a thing, this, my dream, unlike breaking the laws of physics, which is a pretty cool dream, uh, actually does exist in the real world, but it's not in cargo yet. So because Rust is a statically typed language, um, one of the things that we can do um, the Elm programming language has already actually implemented this, but I want to bring it to Cargo. So the idea is um, when I say, hey, Crates.io, here's a new version of this package, um, it can actually look at all the type signatures of all of the functions and the previous version, and then look at the type signatures of what I'm uploading and the new version and say, hey, you made a breaking change in a type signature, but you did not bump the major version, major version. I'm going to reject this package or hey, you added new things, but you only incremented the bug fix, you actually need to make this a minor release instead. So that kind of automatic validation of Semver by the, the server itself um, is possibly my most desired feature. Um, just have to find time, you know, that extremely you know, resource that everyone has so much of, um, yeah. All right, great. So Oya, of course, didn't have uh, enough time to ask all the questions. Make sure you track them all down and ask the questions that you might have. Uh, but thank you very much. <laughs>